morning. You said, Preacher, out of all the things I've been through, Preacher, I should have lost my mind a long time ago. But guess what? I'm still in right, right mind. Preacher, I should have been locked up in a penitentiary a long time ago. But thank God, I'm still free. Everybody got their own testimony about what could have happened, what should have happened. But thank God, didn't any of it happen because God had his hands on you. God bless each and every single one of you here on this morning. And we thank all of you that are watching us via live stream. God bless you. So glad to have you as well. We thank um, those of you that are here that are visiting with us. So glad to have Mama Gina here uh, with us today. Um, a dear friend of mine as well as Angel. They drove down from Savannah this morning. Amen. Amen. And look, just think. They watch, she watches us every Sunday. I know every Sunday online. So she said online wasn't good enough this morning. So she had to get up and she had to come and be here with us this morning. So we're glad to have you um, as well. And all the rest of y'all watching, I know you want to come too. Go on and get in your car. Go on and put a little gas in there. I know it might take you a little while, but guess what? It'll be worth the ride. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. So glad to have you. Um, we had an awesome time on yesterday with our trunk or treat. I want to give a kudos to the youth department for putting that effort together um, and everybody that came out to be a part of it. Had a lot of kids that came up. They tried to get me to run behind them all night, but that wasn't going to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm checking, but I was a different kind of checking. I was a retired checking. I did all the running and stuff I can. It's time to sit down. So. Yeah, that was the check I was. So we thank God for that as well as on last week. Um, we had a wonderful time with our family week um, on last week. Um, it began last Sunday and ended on last Wednesday. Um, and I, I believe that if you came and you attended, if you listened to those things that are said, it will help you to be uh, not have a better family, but to be a better you so you can have a better family. Amen. Because before we can have a better family, we got to, first of all, work on ourselves. Amen. Amen. That's a different sermon for a different day. But uh, this morning, anybody come to hear a word from the Lord? Amen. Amen. We'll be in John chapter two. The gospel according to St. John chapter number two. And we'll be reading verses number one through ten this morning. For our consideration, the grass withers and the flower thereof shall fade away. But the word of our God shall stand forever. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And the Bible says, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, uh, You know, this couldn't have been none of us talking to our mom, you know. He said, Jesus said to her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother said to his servants, Whatsoever he says to you, do it. And there was set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servant which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Verse 10. And he said unto them, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, dear Lord, be acceptable in thy sight. If you would, let me go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear wise and gracious Heavenly Father, it is so gracious, Father, we are humble at this moment. Thankful for this time that you have blessed us with. Father, we are reminded of the fact that we would not be here at this moment had it not been for your mercy and your grace. Father, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Father, I pray that through the preaching of your word today, Father, that somebody might be encouraged. That somebody might be uplifted. That somebody that finds themselves on the backside of life, Father, may be lifted up. And may some wavering soul, Father, come to the knowledge of who you are and what they need to do in order to have their soul saved. Now, Father, I ask that you would hide me behind your cross 
that no flesh would take any glory in that that you ought to receive. And Father, we'll be so ever mindful to give you the glory and the praise for doing so. It is in your darling son, Jesus' name we pray. Let all those that love God say amen. 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 I want to talk to you all this morning briefly about the subject, why you need the Holy Ghost. Why you need it. The Holy Ghost. And I want to talk to you all about that because in the Hebrew culture, I want to explain there was a great importance upon marriage in the marriage ceremony, um, dealing with the vows and the covenant that they take. It was a serious thing to even consider getting married and that if you even got engaged to someone and you decided to call the marriage off during the engagement, you couldn't just do that. You couldn't just say, I'm done with it. You had to literally draw up a bill of divorcement if you wanted that to happen. This is told in the story of Joseph and Mary. You had to write up. If the engagement was that serious of a commitment, can you imagine how serious of a commitment marriage was in this time in which Jesus attended this wedding to perform his first miracle and to begin his earthly ministry? It was more than a ceremony, weddings, especially in Jesus' day, it was something that would go on for days and days and days. And people came in from everywhere. Remember, they were all in small villages. And it was just a community celebration. All of the neighbors, all of their friends, all of the dignitaries would come. Everybody would be there. It was a party that nobody wanted to miss. Amen. And they would come from everywhere. And it was a massive celebration that went on for seven days. If you can imagine, it was a huge party. And I've studied this. It was, I mean, this was a party that nobody wanted to miss. And what I love about this story is that Jesus was invited to the wedding. He was invited to the party. He had not yet begun his earthly ministry and yet he gets up and he was invited to the party. He went to the party, he got up, he got his clothes on and I'm sure as he was about to go out the door, his disciples were hustling and bustling, trying to get their clothes ready and go with him. And I'm sure they thought, where are we going? I don't know, probably going to the synagogue. Man, we went to the synagogue yesterday, probably going down there to the church. He probably got a brand new revelation and teaching that he's going to share with the multitudes. We're going to do something spiritual. I can just about bet you it's going to be something like that. And as they're leaving, somebody just casually says, where are we going, Jesus? He said, we're going to a party. We are going to a party, not a synagogue, not a church, not a miracle meeting. We are going to a party. When he got there, there was quite a celebration going on. They were people who were dancing and hooping and hollering and singing and drinking and carrying on like you wouldn't even believe. And Jesus was there. They had the head table. They had the guest of honor. They had the governor of that region. They had the bridegroom and everybody was there. But the real guest of honor was not at the table. He was not up front. He was among the people and they didn't even know that he was there. Church, did you know that you can be in the presence of God and not get the benefits of God until circumstances arise that only God can handle? Sometimes God manipulates circumstances so that you can come to an awareness of who is really with you. You know, sometimes we feel like we have certain individuals on our side. And as long as those certain individuals are on our side, we have all that we need to get to where we need to be. But how many of y'all know that there's only a certain extended time that people can be with you? There's only a certain distance that they are able to go with you. But you need that friend that is able to stick closer than a brother. He was at the party. They were at the party. And, and, and you know that, that, that the party was going on. And Jesus, when the Bible talks about joy, sustainable joy, that party that the devil will throw you is one that sooner or later will run out of wine. Sooner or later, there's a pleasure in sin for a season. Somebody said it like this, sin is like the credit card. Enjoy now, but you got to pay for it later. 
Then the party, they're, they're partying, they're partying, but they ain't got no wine. And at some point it hits them, y'all, we don't have anything to keep the party going, y'all. We done ran out of wine. Folk gonna start leaving after a while. The party scene isn't as great as you thought it was. The money hasn't got the power that you think it does. The person that you're willing to wreck your wall for doesn't fulfill you like you thought that he would or she would because everything that the devil offers you you, he offers you the best first and then it gets worse and the ride runs out of the party every time church there is no sustainable joy in turning your back on God there's no good in turning your back on God and walking away from the presence of God. There is no sustainable joy. Can I tell you, there's no amount of money that it can give to you. No amount of success can give it to you. No amount, I don't care where you live, what neighborhood, or if I just had that, I would have sustainable joy. No, you would not. If Jesus is not the center of your life, you will never have sustainable joy. You will never have sustainable sustainable peace. You will never have the happiness that God wants you to have until Jesus is at the center of your life. It was in this moment that when something went on out of the party, everybody's looking at the bride at this moment. The couple looking at the governor, looking at the celebrities that were at the main host table, looking at all the wedding party and what they were wearing and all of that. But the moment that it ran out, all got their attention. Isn't it funny how we can focus on everybody but Jesus until we get in an emergency? Jesus didn't plan on doing anything. His mama made him do it. He said, it's not my time, mama. And she said, whatever he said, do, do it. That means you're going to do something. Now out of here and go do it like I told you to do or I'm going to see you when I get home. But this is an emergency. All of a sudden, the party crowd is talking about if there is a God up there, we can sure use some help. It's kind of like the church has come to the world's party after all that we've been through the last year or so going through this pandemic now. Now, now is the time for Jesus to give the world what it is missing. And notice how he does that. In verse number six, he said, bring me the six ceremonial pots Fill them with water to the brim. He didn't say fill it halfway. He said fill it up to the brim. I want you to bring those six. Six is the number of man. It is also the number of sin. And they were ceremonial pots that were used by the Jews to wash themselves before they went into the temple. And he said, I want you to bring those old religious pots and I'm going to do a, a new work in those old pots. Church, this represents the church that basically has nothing to offer a world that has no joy. Because we have become so religious, all we care about is our own personal righteousness and holiness and how pure and how clean we are while the world is dying, while they are dying right before our eyes. And the Lord says, I'm going to use those old ceremonial pots, but I'm going to have to do a new miracle with the same old pots. And I wonder sometimes if we don't watch it, that we don't become the church and we become old pots. We get in here and we hear a song like we sang this morning, but we sing it, but do we really believe what it is that we are singing? We sing about how God is a way maker, how God is a miracle worker, but do you really believe that God is a way maker and God is a miracle worker or is it just something that you are singing? But we got to get past the point to where we can sing something and where we actually have conviction in my heart. I know my God is real, not because you told me, but because he's real in my own life. Somebody said, I can feel him in my hands. I can, I can feel him in my feet. I feel him all over me. He said, fill them with water to the brim. And I like the fact that he said, fill them with water to the brim. See, if they had brought Jesus pots full of grapes, and he would have made them turn that into wine, that would have been understandable. But he said, I want you to bring me something 
that has none of the source of what I will make out of it in itself. Church, there is no way that water can make itself by its own actions turn into wine. There are two completely different creations. One is water and one comes from the grape. It is wine. And the two are not the same. And he said, I want you to fill them to the brim with what I know it cannot be pleasing to them. And when it's full and when you know, in other words, when you are full of pride, when you are full of religi religiosity, when you are full of self-justification, your own holiness, your own righteousness, all of this stuff, God got to come and empty you out so he can fill you up with his spirit. And God says, when you finally get full of what I want you to be full of, I want you to bring me what you are full of that you can never, ever, ever, all of your righteousness, when you are full of it, you ain't got no room for God. What does the Bible say? That all of our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags before God. And it says, you come now. And I cannot explain to you, the Bible isn't clear. It doesn't give one hit. It said, and he said to them, when they filled it with full, he said, pour it out. And that means they were pouring it from one vessel into another vessel. And while the pouring was taking place, the power of his presence. It's not enough church to sing songs and just talk from the pulpit. There will be no transformation. Water is weak, but wine is strong. Water is cheap and worthless, but wine is expensive. Water is tasteless. Wine is intoxicated. How in the world can I make that into this? There's only one answer. It has to get into the power of the presence of Almighty God. And I'm so desperate for that because there is a generation coming, church, that hears sermons and stuff. But if we don't get desperate to get ourselves into these services, into the power of the presence of God, my greatest gift to communicate with people will not transform water into wine. I can talk to this water in this pool until my tongue fall out my mouth. It's not going to turn into wine. But if I can somehow become a gateway, and if we can all somehow become a gateway to lead hungry people, to lead dying people into the presence of God, suddenly, he said, it's being poured out. And God began turning water into wine. Everybody say the power of his presence. How long has it been, and I want you to be real with me, since you've been in his presence? I ain't talking about when you came to church on Sunday morning. I'm not talking about when you came here on Wednesday night, but I'm talking about in your own life. When was it in your own house that you ever just welcomed God into your home and you say, you know what? I just need to spend some time with my Savior because I know I just came out of a week that beat me up all side my head and I don't know what's coming on tomorrow. That's why I got to find myself in the presence of God, giving God the praise. That's why I got to come to him so I can be like David. Lord, I need you to create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. When was the last time you were in the presence of God? When was the last time you left church saying, I'll never be the same again? And as they poured it, you church, you can't evolve into what God wants you to be. It only comes from being in the presence of God. And as they poured it, Jesus said, go out there and serve it to the governor. The guy who has everything. And he has a preconceived idea that what they were offering him was inferior because he said, I really don't want to drink that trash that y'all bringing to me because what I've got, you can't afford it no how. I got the best stuff. And what is this Jesus? I ain't never heard of him. But anyway, whatever you got, just bring it up here. You're offering me that compared to who I am. I'm the governor. I got a position. Have you seen the houses that I have? Have you seen the chariot that I rolled up in? He didn't have a car, but it might have been a Bentley or something he would have rolled up in. Do you know what kind of rims that I rolled up on? Do you know? Do you know what kind of boat I ride in? All of that did not matter. Here's the big point. How do you explain 
water to wine. You can't. All you can do is taste it. How do I explain the baptism and the Holy Spirit? How do I explain that God can heal? How do I explain the gifts of the Spirit? How do I explain walking with Jesus? How do I do that? There are some things that I can explain. But then there are certain things, church, that you got to experience in your own life. There are certain things that you got to live through. You got to find yourself at your wit's end and can't depend on nobody else. But you got to lean on the everlasting arms of God. Has anybody in here ever been so down on your luck that you couldn't call nobody? All you can do is just lift up your hand and say, Lord, help me. You can lift up your head and say, Lord, I need you to show up right now. Certain things, church, you got to experience for yourself. The only thing you can do is try to get people into the power of his presence long enough that they can take a sip. And the thought, y'all are just lucky I'm at the party, Jesus said. And I really don't want this cheap stuff. Because I'm used to the best stuff. That's the governor talking. I don't even know. So he says here, because this guy said, I have the preconceived idea that what you are bringing me is not good. Then he takes a sip of it. Then the Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord, he is good. He says, I had life. But you know what? After I tasted this, now I got life more abundantly. I had joy, but now that I've tasted of this, I got sustainable joy. Now, but that, I don't mean that I have a perfect life. I don't mean that I'm excluded from pain and sorrow and trials and tough days. But I have sustainable joy that no matter what I'm going through, I'm going to get out of this thing. Encourage somebody next to him and say, you're going to get up out of this thing. The governor said, oh, Lord, where y'all get this stuff from? Y'all got any more of it back there? He said, most people serve the best first and then bring the cheap stuff out. But you have saved the best for last. Then Jesus turns and says to his disciples, I want you to go to Jerusalem because I'm about to go to heaven. Oh, Lord, no, you're the best. We can't make it without you. You are our comforter. When we get in the storms, you come walking on the water. When we need provision, you made the fish pay our taxes. You're the one that we need, Lord. You can't leave us. No, he said, it's all right. John chapter 14 and verse number 16, he said, I will send you another comforter. He said, I'm going to send you another comforter. He'll hold you at the grave side of a loved one. Come on, somebody. He'll be there in the middle of the night when your mind is racing and you don't even know what to do and you don't have all the answer and you feel like the world is on your shoulders. He'll be your comforter. He'll attach himself to you because I'm going to go away and you thought I was the best. But I'm sending you a comforter yes, called the Holy Ghost. Yes. So can you see those 120 disciples? You know, Mary, the mother of Jesus was there. Peter, James, and John were there. They go up in this upper room. And he says, stay there 50 days until the day of Pentecost. And they were trying to have church. They were trying to have a party. But they didn't have no wine. That's why I'm glad to be in a place like this. I'm sorry, but that is a different. I said, there's a different in going to church. And then going to church and actually experiencing the power of God. Actually experiencing the presence of God. And my honest desire and prayer for the sweet water church of Christ is that we never become old stale water pots but that we always remain a place where the presence of God can rule and abide and a place where God can reign he said well two or three are gathered in my name touching and agreeing on anything there am I in the midst of them I don't want to come to church unless Jesus is there Because he said, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty to set you free. I can't
can't set you free. There's nothing that I can do that can set you free. Ain't nothing that I can do that can get nobody off drugs. Ain't nothing that I can do that can stop somebody from lying. You're going to lie until you get tired of lying. There is nothing that I can do in and of myself to draw change out of an individual. That's why you need the help of your comforter. That's why you need the help of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because now that Jesus is no longer here, he promised to send us a comforter. So when those times when you get lonely and you feel like you're by yourself, he said, don't feel like you're by yourself because the Holy Ghost is right there by your side. When you feel like what you're doing is the best thing and you're about to make a wrong decision, the Holy Spirit is there to guide you in the direction that you are supposed to go. We ought not be scared of the Holy Ghost, church. It's a comforter. It's a help that God has offered available to us. And he said in the word, he said, if you have not the Holy Spirit, you ain't none of his. He went as far to say that if you ain't got it, you don't even belong to him. And whether you recognize it or not, church, if you are living a life that God has called for you to live, he's living on the inside of you right now. Because he said in his word, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And what you going to get? You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How many of us could afford it? But he gave it to us, church. He loved us enough. To not leave us comfortless. Jesus knew that we would be messed up. He knew that we couldn't make it. He knew that in and of ourselves we'd be left to our own destruction. He knew we needed a comforter. He knew that we needed some help to live day to day. Because if y'all be real with me, every day that you get up, it's a fight to live for Jesus. I, well, let me be, let me let me change that because I know some of y'all the next thing to Jesus and that your name is the first one on the road and when you get to the gate they're gonna have a, a monogram thing with your name on it, welcome into heaven, because you did it all right. But some of y'all will be real and honest with me, preacher. I done messed up 10, 12, 13 times before I got here this morning. Preacher, I am still a work in God's creation. I know in and of myself I want to go that way, but God is telling me to go that way. That's why I need the spirit spirit of God. That's why I need something to guide me. That's why I need something to direct me because if I don't have it, I go the wrong way. I go the wrong way if I don't have it. And can I tell you sometimes the spirit boy get the, sometimes you can't do nothing but cry. Any of y'all ever, ever been in, in the worship service of God and you just been, your mind just been went back and you just been thinking about how good God has been to you? Time that the doctor has shook his head, but now you are sitting here giving God praise and you just begin thinking about that stuff. Sometimes it moves you to just wave your hands in celebration of what God has done for you. Sometimes you can't help but to open your mouth, use the fruit of your lips to give God praise because you got something on the inside working on the outside, bringing about a change in your life. That's what you need in church. You can't go without him. You need him, church. If you ever expect to live how God has called for you to live, church, you need him. Because we like the group naughty by nature. All of us have an appetite for sin. I know you, I know you say you don't, but all of us have an appetite for sin and destruction and wrong. It's been that way since the beginning. God said, Don't eat of it because of the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. The devil came along and said, In the day that you eat of it, you shall not surely die. Well, maybe I won't die. Let me try it out. That's just like us. We know what God has commanded of us to do, but yet and still we go out there and we do everything except what God has called for us to do. We live lives every way except for lives the way that God has called for us to live, but to bring us back to where we need to be, we need the Spirit of God. Church, you're in a bad place if you don't have his presence. You are in a bad way, church, if you don't have the presence of God. To get caught up living your life, committing wrongdoing, 
and you don't see no, 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 nothing wrong with it. To live your life, to get caught up in a way of doing things, and that's not the way that God is pleased with. And you don't have something on, we call it a conscience, but we don't have anything on the inside of us that's saying, you know what, you should not do this, you should not go over there, you should not be doing this, but we be real about it. You know what, we hear that stuff and we just turn it out, you know, we turn the radio up just a little bit louder. We get, we get the remote and we turn the TV up just a little bit louder because we've already made our minds up about what we want to do about the plans that we have, church. But how many of y'all know that his ways are not our ways? His thoughts are not our thoughts. He said, as far as the heavens are from the earth, so far are his ways from our ways. Church, the only way you're gonna have to, you're gonna be who God has called for you to be is if you have the same experience that they had. He brought them these old, these old water pots. And with those old water pots, he said, you know what? I'm going to do a new thing. Mm -hmm. How many of y'all need God to do a new thing in your life on this morning? He said in his word, he said, behold, I do a new thing. He said, he said, it shall spring forth. I do a new thing in your life. Can I tell you, I don't care what side of the track you find yourself on this morning. God can do a new thing in your life. I don't care what decisions you made. I don't care how you disappointed this person and that person. God can do a new thing in your life. God can change it. God can take your feet out of the miry clay. Set your feet upon a rock to stand. He'll establish your going and your coming when you trust in him. And when you lean on him for your direction and where you need to go. He said in his word, he said, and men being evil know how to give good gifts to their children. How much more shall the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Church, can I tell you that the Holy Spirit cannot live in a nasty house. He cannot live in an unclean temple. So maybe you feel like you are missing the presence of the Spirit of God. Check out your, check your house out. Check out the environment that he is housing in. Is it a place that is welcoming of the presence of God? Is it a place where he can live and where he can abide? Because you prepared that for him. Church, we need him, church. You cannot do it by yourself. You need the help of the Spirit of God. And I'm so glad because those folks, they knew Jesus, you're the best. Lord, what we gonna do without you? We can't make it. Jesus said, I know, that's why I'm gonna send you another comforter. And thank God, God loves us enough that he didn't just come to us one time, he came to us again. Because he said, you know what, the first time he said, there's no one in the earth that is found worthy to do what it is that I need to do. So I'm going to come down in the form of a man. I'm going to be born of a woman. I'm going to come into the earth. I'm going to live for 33 years on this earth. I'm going to be the one to go to the cross and die for your sin. I'm going to be the one that's going to get up from the grave with all power in my hand. And guess what? Since that ain't enough for y'all, and I know y'all can't do it by yourself, I'm going to come again as another comforter in that of the Holy Spirit and how be it when he the spirit of truth is come he shall guide you into the knowledge and the truth of all things God the father always been in heaven God the son came down and lived among us now God the Holy Ghost has come to live on the inside of you I can't see him but I thank God for it. I thank God for his presence. I thank God for the help that he has made available to us. That's what they were waiting on, church. When they were there in the book of Acts, chapter number two, after Jesus had already told them that he was going away, that he was going to die, and all of the things that he was going to have to suffer, and after he told his disciples right there, he said, go and wait in Jerusalem and wait from the power on high. And then the book of Acts, chapter number two, you find that you have the disciples that are gathered together there in the upper room, and they are waiting from the promise that God had promised unto them, and it said they were gathered there together, and that can 
and fell upon them, cloven tongues like it under fire, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And some said, these men are drunk with wine. Somebody said, man, they ain't drunk because the liquor store ain't even on up yet. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last day. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dream. Your young men shall dream dream. This is that which he has spoken. And now it's taking place on the day of Pentecost. You got Parthians, you got Medes, you got Eliamites, you got dwellers in Mesopotamia and Cappadocia and Asia. They're all gathered there together. But all of these men are hearing them speak in their own languages. They're speaking in their own tongue. That's why you know God had to have a hand in it because you can't tell me that folks that ain't never heard a lick of Chinese understand what these folks are saying. Folks that ain't never heard a lick of English are hearing what these folks are saying because God gave those disciples the ability to speak what everybody would be able to understand. And you see, when folk don't understand what God is doing, they always gonna call you a drunk. <laughs> they always gonna think something wrong when they don't understand what God is doing. But after they understood, this is that which was spoken. And now they understand, y'all, we didn't kill Jesus. We didn't kill the Savior. The one that came for us. Because all of this stuff going on, it was already prophesied about. It's already happened. This is that which was spoken. And it said that Peter got up, y'all, because y'all know Peter already had the keys, right? right? When did he get those keys in Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18, when he told me, he said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. On the day of Pentecost, Peter got up there and he let them know he preached unto them the unsearchable riches of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And after he finished, men and brethren, what shall we do? Y'all, the Bible says that after they heard what it is that Peter had preached unto them, it said they were pricked in their heart. Have y'all ever been pricked in your heart? Has the word of God ever just slapped you upside your head, left and right? Has the word, because let me tell you, the word will do that for you. The Bible says that the word of God is like a double-edged sword. That means if you hold it or you receive it, you're going to get cut either way. So can I tell you, just as much as the word of God is hitting you, it's tearing my mouth all up because it got to come out of here to get to you. The word of God, church. It's just like that. And after those folk had heard the word of God, not just heard it, but they seen all of this stuff going on. Yes, what shall we do? What shall we do? In order to have our soul saved. Yes, what do we need to do? All of this stuff taking place. All of this stuff is happening. Now what shall we do? In order to be saved. Peter looked at him and said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the promise that he gave us, church. That's the promise that he gave us. Be baptized. So, ain't no such thing as you got the Holy Ghost and you ain't been baptized. You can't tell me that. Prove it. Follow me over to the book of Acts. Chapter number 10 and chapter number 11. I said it last week. What well, you find? Peter, as he's been sent, because y'all know at this time, Peter is still racist. Peter don't like the Gentile people. That's why God had to send Peter down there to the Gentiles. And God sends him down there to the house of Simon, who is a tanner. And God gives him that vision because you got to understand there's only two times when you are ever find somebody getting the Holy Ghost before they were baptized. That's in Acts chapter 2 and that's in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11 when they were there at the house of Cornelius and God poured the Spirit out on the Gentiles just like he did the Jews. The only thing is, the first time he did it as a sign for the Jews and the second time he did it for a sign as well to let them know that Gentiles were to be included in the body of Christ. And somebody missed a shout right there because you're a Gentile. I 
say you a Gentile. And God thought enough to not exclude you, but to include you into his plan. But what I love about it, church, is that even though Peter and them received the outpouring of the Spirit of God, they still had to be baptized for the remission of their sin. Can I give you another example? You remember when they, 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 they were in jail and God did the jailhouse rock when they were locked up? Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that? And it's sad that y'all know because at this time, if you were a, a guard or anything like that, if you were to lose somebody that was in custody, your life had to be taken in their place. So as the jail has rocket, and the Bible says that all of their chains were loosened, but here's the blessed part about it, that everybody stayed right where they were. It would have been me, I'd have been running out the nearest window, getting out the nearest door. But the Bible tells me that they stayed right where they were and the jailer thought everybody had left and the Bible said that he took out his sword getting ready to take his own life but they said do yourself no harm for we are all here and they said that they explained unto him the word of God and they said that that night well, I want to mention this first, that they told him believe on the Lord with all of thy heart and thou shalt be saved but it didn't stop right there because he went on down a little bit further and it said they took him, not just him, but all of his house and baptized them straightway. Church, there ain't but one way that God has instituted for us to be saved. And I know we live in a world because if you turn your TV to too many channels, you'll get confused. If you flip on too many folk on your Facebook page, you'll get confused. But we ought to get to a place where we don't take no word from a man that put their pants on one leg at a time just like you. But you ought to go to the word of God. And if it ain't coming out the book, you a crook. It ain't but one way that God has established for men, women, children of life to be saved. And the same way that they were saved on the day of Pentecost. Is the same way that we are saved today, church. Ain't no substitution. Ain't no, you choose how you want to do it. You got to be saved that way or not be saved at all. That's the word of God, church. That's the gospel that we have been summoned to give to others. But y'all know, even right now, I cannot preach to you unless I have the help of the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you, majority of the stuff that I say, it comes from God giving it to me. You know, there have been many times I have studied and I have prepared to preach a lesson and what I prepared is not what I preach. That's why as ministers, and I'm glad with my preacher friends, we always share this with each other, that you always got to be susceptible to God. And what God wants to do with his people. And let me tell y'all what I found to be true. That when I lean on God. And when I give God the opportunity to speak to his people. It never changes that people leave with what they needed. People leave. People get what they need. Have you ever came here and it sounded like I was in your house all week long? Have you ever? Have you ever came here? And it sounds like the preacher has been listening to your phone calls, like he had been eavesdropping in on your prayer because God knew what you needed. He ain't gonna do me no good to get up here and teach you how to black cock and eat green grass and get white milk. That ain't gonna help you. We gotta give people the word of God. The Bible calls the term rhema word. That means on time. In season, what people need. People need the gospel. In this day, church, and in this hour that we are living in, we can't sit on it. We got to hold it up. We got to hold up the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ. What happened to the old church? What happened? We're not evangelistic like we used to be. We're not going out seeking to save souls and to keep souls safe. We forgot about all that. 
We didn't got comfortable. Sitting at the dock of the bay, just watching the tide roll away. We didn't got comfortable. When we get forgotten that he said in his word that he that in birth until he get baptized. No, the Bible said that he that in birth until the end shall be saved. And I don't care if you've been in the church two or 20 years, you still got work that you need to do, church. You still got work that you need to do. But can I tell you, even in your evangelizing, you need the help of the Holy Spirit. Because if you go out doing it by yourself instead of drawing, you're going to push folk away. That's why you need the Spirit of God, because he said in his word that with love and kindness have I drawn thee. You need the Spirit of God if you're going to be effective. If you're going to be who God has called you to be, you need his Spirit. You need the presence of God. And can I tell y'all, I'm so glad, and, and I purpose it, and I make it my business to make sure that in my life, it's a place where God can inhabit. And if I always make that a number one priority, can I tell you, Sister Reed, I ain't got to wait till I get here the Sunday morning to offer God a praise. I ain't got to wait until I get here with y'all on Sunday morning to lift up the name of God, but I can be driving on my way to work and say, hey, I will bless the Lord at all times. And it's praise shall continually be in my mouth. Why can I do that? Because he's right there with me. Dick and Reed, he told us in his word. You know, when you get the word about what you're going to say, he said, think not in that hour what you're going to say. When men ask you a reason of the hope that is in you, he said, because the Holy Spirit will bring back to your remembrance those things that you ought to say. But can I tell you, the Holy Spirit can't bring back what you don't know. The Holy Spirit cannot bring back to your remembrance what you haven't first of all studied. Thank God for his presence. I thank God for his spirit. Can I tell y'all, and, and, you know, and, 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 and it's, it's a difference, let me tell y'all, in, in being in online service and, and actually being here. Because yeah, I'm sure y'all can tell that the spirit is sent from watching online. But can I tell you, ain't nothing like being here for yourself. Ain't nothing like being here, being caught up in the praises of God for yourself, church. Can I tell y'all, I live here some Sundays and I can't even go to sleep because I'm just caught up in the glory of God. Can I tell you something? I leave here and I'm just restless. And anybody else like me all week long just thinking about the worship experience, thinking about the word of God, and you can't wait until the next Sunday morning. But can I tell you, if you welcome God's presence in your life, you don't have to wait till Sunday to have that kind of experience. You can have it every day of your life. When you are true worshiper. God. True worshipers don't have to be around a crowd to worship God. True worshipers, true worshipers got a closet at their house. It might not be a closet, but guess what? It just might be a corner or whatever it is. A place where you can get by yourself and worship him and give God the praise that is due unto him. I thank God for his spirit. I thank God for his presence. And again, my humble prayer and desire is that we continue to be a place where the presence of God is welcome. Where the presence of God is welcome. Because he said that where my presence, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty to set you free. People can be set free from the shackles that they have in this life. People can forsake sin and reach a hold to salvation when the presence of God is made available to them. He's here, church. I know you can't see him, but guess what? He's here. He's here with us. And guess what? As we've been singing, I know it might not have sounded good to you, but guess what? It was coming up to him. He said, as a sweet smelling Savior, God was receiving the glory. God was receiving the reverence. And when we get in that mindset, that when you come to church, that you are not a spectator, you are a performer. God is the audience. And we are the ones that are performing. And anybody that's in that place, you ought to want to give God your best. You ought to want to give God your all. 
You don't want God to partly bless you, so don't partly bless God. You ought to want to give God everything that you have. Might not sound like Mahalia, but you ought to sing like you is, Mahalia. Come on, somebody. Might not sound like Stevie Wonder, but you ought to sing like you are. And if for no other reason, because God has been good to me. Anybody can say, preacher, you've been better than me than I even thought about being to myself. Preacher, when I didn't care about myself, I thank God that he cared about me. When I was going down my own road, going down to self-destruction, I thank God that he loved me enough to come to where I was and to bring me back to where I needed to be. I am thank God that even when I got out there, it was big and bad enough to do what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. I thank God for the presence of his spirit in my life, that even when those times come, he was still there. You can do it. You can make it. You can get out of this thing. You don't have to stay here. I thank God. That he did not leave us by ourselves, but he gave us some help, church. Start using the help that God has given you. Start using the help that God has made available to you, church. When you find yourself weak, Lord, strengthen my inner man. Because can I tell you that even though your spirit may be willing, the flesh is weak. Though you may desire to do good, there's still a part of you that does not want to do good. That's why you need his spirit, church. That's why you need his help. So that you can make it in this life. So you can what? Take a lick and keep right on taking. So that you can take the punches and the blows of life that it throws at you. And you can keep a smile on your face and you can keep a praise in your mouth because you know, guess what? This thing that I'm going through right now is not the end of me. This thing right here. Some of y'all got to stop putting a period where God to put a comma and learn how to let God continue to write because this is not the end of the story. God got that power, church, to change your situation for the better if you'll give him the opportunity. That's why you need him this morning. That's why you need his presence and his power in your life so that you can make it. Can I tell you? You can't make it a step without God's help. Can I tell you? I know you think you're in just as good a shape. You're taking all your vitamins. You're taking vitamin D, vitamin Z, vitamin X, vitamin Y. Got all of it. You going, you getting all your health there when you drinking your herbal teas and you're doing all this kind of stuff. You're doing all of this stuff. Oh, I, I'm in good shape. Look, I'm going to the gym. I'm, I'm, do, I'm getting right. But except God said arms move, them arms ain't going to move. Except God said fear your right mind, you won't wake up knowing who you are. The Bible says it's not in man to direct his own steps. No matter how much you have, no matter what kind of education you have, it doesn't matter, church. You just are not enough. You need God's presence. And you need his help. Let's go home today and let's do some rearranging. Some things that are present, let's put them in the garbage can where they belong. Some things that are not as God desires for them to be, let's straighten them out. Let's get them ready. Let's act like God is on his way to your house. Because if God sent you an invitation and said he was coming to your house, you'd be calling the cleaning service. Y'all get up there on the real Get, get them baseboards down there. Get on, get on there and wash them sofas up. Get the plastic out and put it on the chair. Because Jesus is coming. But can I tell you, one day he is coming. So shouldn't you want to already have your house ready? Have it in order. Have it like it need to be. So that when he comes, he'll find you faithful. And he come back, because can I tell you, when he come back, he said in his word, he said, let the wheat and the tares grow up together. He said that when I come back, Separated. Now, can I tell you, God know who real and he know who fake. 
Can I tell you, he knew the difference between the saints and the ain'ts in here this morning. He know it. He knows it. We need to be preparing ourselves, church. Getting ourselves ready, because if we leave in our souls, don't go to heaven. You can't blame me. Can't blame Brother Coffee. None of the elders or the deacons, you can't blame them. Your sister, your brother, you can't blame them. Oh, well, this person was not in my life. You can't blame them. There's only one individual that God is going to ask God. He's going to ask you. When you stand before him, church, let's be found faithful. So that we can be like the Apostle Paul and say, you know what? I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. And because I did that, henceforth is laid up for me now a crown of righteousness. But not only for me, but for all those who love Christ and his appearance. Thank God for his spirit today. Thank God. And if there is anything present in your life that will cause the spirit to not have a place where he can abide and where he can live, Let's correct those things in our life so that we can constantly have the presence of God available in our life. Because, uh, and I tell you this in close, if you feel like you are not as close to God as you used to be, disclaimer, he didn't move. If you feel like you are not as near and as close to God as you once were, God ain't moved. We got out of the way. We moved. So guess what? Just like we move to the left, we move back to the right. Y'all like that they move. To the right. Too hot this time. You know we gotta, we gotta get back to where God has called us to be. I can't remember how you put it, but when brother he preached his last time, you did the step thing. Like, <laughs> we gotta get back in step. We got to be who God has called us to be, church. Stop playing. I know sometimes we can get in this mindset and think that this thing is just a game. It ain't no game. You know how when you was little, you used to be playing the game with your brother and your sister, and they might have been beating you, so you just cut the game off so y'all can restart it? That was me, you know. But you, you know what? You know, you know, you go, go hit, hit start, so you go back and hit replay and start it over again because you was getting beat down. Life is not like that. You don't die and lose your soul and get a redo. You got one shot at this thing. You got one chance. Make the best of the opportunity that God has made available to you. Because how much time do you have left? You don't know. The question is, what are you going to do with the time that you do have right now? Somebody need to come to Jesus with the time that they have left to them. Come to him, church, today. Don't put off today for what you plan on doing at another time. Who can say that we're all going to be here next Sunday? Who's to say that we don't leave here and God decide to let Gabriel come on out and sound his trumpet? And the dead in Christ rise up and we go to meet the Lord in there. Who's to say that that does not happen? But with the time that you have left, Make the change and the choices that you need to make so that you can meet the Lord as you need to meet him. Come by hearing his word. Not just hear the word, but as they did on the day of Pentecost, believe what it is that you have heard. Believe it to the point that you are willing to repent of your sins and to confess Christ as your Savior, leading you to be baptized for the remission of your sins. And as the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 42, and the Lord adds to the church daily, such as should be saved. If you're here today and you are already a Christian, but you say, preacher, I, I just haven't been feeling like I have the presence of God in my life. Preacher, I feel like I'm just so far out and I feel like I'm not as close to God as I used to be. Let us pray for you. Let let us pray for you that you can be drawn back into a closer relationship with God so that you can sing here, leave it, sing it nearer, my God, to thee. Ain't that what we all desire this morning? Just to be nearer to God, just to be closer to him than we were the day before. My brother and my sister, don't put off today for what you got plans on doing. 
Today that you hear my voice, he says, harden not your heart. This is your opportunity. It is being made available to you. You know what decision you need to make. You can do it now as together we stand and sing the song of invitation. I surrender all to you.